Hello, my name is Kim Eagle for ACC.org and we're at the American Heart Association Scientific Meeting. I'm joined today by Pyle Coley from Denver and Deepak Bhatt from Boston. We're gonna talk about four important trials that were reported today. Two are about old friends, uh, loop diuretics and thiazide diuretics. Another one looks at fibrate use. And the last one, I love the name, it's called Iron Man. We're gonna start with a very important trial and Deepak, lead us off with the TRANSFORM heart failure trial. Yeah, absolutely. This was a well-done, well-sized, pragmatic clinical trial to compare two diuretics, torsamide and ferrosamide, so specifically two loop diuretics, and found no difference in terms of all-cause mortality, hospitalization. So really, you can use one, you can use the other. Uh, no superiority that was found. And I think that's useful because some people in practice thought torsamide might be better, uh, but as it turns out, there was really no significant difference. So I think very useful information and a good way to do trials, answering a question in a very pragmatic, I think cost-efficient manner. There are a lot of questions like this that we could answer. So I'd say good job, investigators. I agree with you. And it, it's interesting. We've been saying that, uh, you know, other than Lasix, the other two long, longer acting agents, more bioavailability, you might have more efficacy. Uh, and until we actually study things, we don't really learn. Uh, and this was an important trial. Um, it's sort of like whatever works is what you should use. And sometimes we need to switch to a drug that might work better in a given patient. And it leads us into this uh, second study, uh, which really looked at chlorothalidone and hydrochlorothiazide in hypertension. Pyle, tell us about this trial. Uh, yes, Kim. You know, I love that we're really wondering if our old friends are the right friends that we're using. So this was another pragmatic design recruitment done through the electronic medical record based out of the VA. And it was basically asking the question whether chlorothalidone was superior to hydrochlorothiazide for patients with hypertension. So largely male population because it was recruited from the VA. So mostly, mostly white male population and older patients over the age of 65. And here also we found no difference in the primary endpoint, which was a MACE endpoint of stroke, MI, heart failure, hospitalization, revask, or death. We also didn't find a significant difference in the mean potassium, although those with chlorothalidone had higher levels of very low potassium. And, you know, the parent trial was negative, but if we broke it up by subgroups. You saw that those that had a, a prior MI or stroke maybe did a little bit better with chlorothalidone versus the opposite with those that didn't. Um, but I wouldn't put too much analysis on the subgroups when the parent trial is negative. So again, another pragmatic real world trial that tells us that we could really use either when it comes to hypertension management. One of the criticisms of the trial, of course, was that it was slightly perhaps biased towards those who already tolerated hydrochlorothiazide because the recruitment was based on patients that were already on hydrochlorothiazide and they were then randomized through the EHR. But, but again, I like the fact that we're challenging our old friends here. And I feel like this is really important clinical information for me to take home to my patients. Yeah, I, I also thought that chlorothalidone was a more effective thiazide for years. Some of those early trials in hypertension, particularly the elderly, made us think that maybe it was. And I think this trial really, uh, may, it, it causes us to really question uh, that logic. Both are very effective. And now we get to another old friend, the fibrates, and uh, a trial called Prominent, Deepak. Tell us about this one. Yeah, absolutely. Another well-done trial. This was more of a classic, large, randomized clinical trial, placebo-controlled of pemafibrate, uh, a novel, fancier version of older fibrates. And uh, the bottom line was there was no significant benefit, despite learning from prior fibrate trials where it looked like subgroups of patients say, with really high triglycerides, low HDL, even if those trials, like the field trial, even if they were overall negative, that there were maybe subgroups that were promising. But here, even focusing on those biomarker-enriched groups, the trial did not show any benefit with respect to reduction in cardiovascular endpoints, despite reducing triglycerides. So I think it once again illustrates the disconnect between biomarkers and clinical outcomes and also with respect to triglyceride lowering, not everything that lowers triglycerides necessarily lowers cardiovascular risk. Do you think there's any patient in your practice right now that you would be highly motivated to use a fibrate in? Not for cardiovascular risk reduction, assuming that they're 
doing the best they can on diet and on a statin and that sort of thing. They're really the only time I am using a fibrate is when the triglycerides are greater than 500. And my own algorithm there these days is I would start with icosapentethyl. But if that doesn't reduce the triglycerides to below 500, then I would add a fibrate. The goal there isn't cardiovascular risk reduction. The goal or the hope is pancreatitis reduction by getting the triglycerides somewhere under 500. So in that one situation, I do use fibrates, but other than that, I don't anymore. Yeah, I totally agree with that logic. I think you're right. My favorite name of all the trials being presented at the American Heart Association is Ironman. Pyle, tell us about this really interesting trial. I like it. I like it, Kim, but I think it should also say Iron Woman as well. <laughs> uh, but this is a trial basically asking about IV iron and its long-term safety. So we know that in U.S. guidelines, uh, in patients with heart failure and iron deficiency, there's a class 2B evidence uh, recommendation that we should use IV iron in these patients. We also know from the Affirm AHF study that in the past, it has resulted in some benefit, in, you know, hospitalizations for heart failure. So this was kind of a longer term look to say, what is the long term safety and efficacy of, of an IV iron formulation? It was what we call a probe design. So prospective, open label with a blinded endpoint design also linked through the EHR seems to be a theme for the day, enrolled a different variety of types of heart failure, um, if you've had an EF less than or equal to 45 in the last two years and class two to four, and some documented evidence of, you know, a low iron or um, iron saturation based on your ferritin and based on your transferrin saturation. And the idea wasn't just a one dose of iron, it was an iterative dose based on what those numbers look like over the course of the trial. Now, the problem with the trial was that COVID-19 hit and a lot of patients got lost to follow up and actually didn't end up getting those subsequent doses and such. So, so they did an overall analysis and they actually and actually had a referee of the trial to do a, a post hoc COVID sensitivity analysis where they censored the data. And essentially the primary outcome of recurrent hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death was numerically lower for patients that received the IV iron preparation, but the difference was not statistically significant. And the other outcomes generally favored the IV iron, including fewer serious adverse cardiovascular events and a little bit better on the Minnesota heart failure scale. Um, but this tells us basically with some amount of confidence that at least over median follow-up of 2.7 years, the IV iron therapy appeared to be safe appear to be well tolerated and may generally be beneficial. So I think very much in alignment with the Affirm AHF trial, which was a, you know, inpatient population, this was more of an outpatient population, but very much in alignment with the guidelines as well. And I know that I have been doing iron repletion in my patients that have heart failure um, and iron deficiency. So certainly suggest that for our HEFREF population, we should be measuring ferritin, transferrin, uh, in our anemic patients and repleting those folks who are iron deficient, uh, and whether it works in other populations with heart failure like MRF or HEF-PEF perhaps requires more delineation. And, and I would add, Kim, that it wasn't just the anemic patients. It was actually even patients that had low transferrin saturations without anemia. So perhaps we just ought to be using this test more often. I think you're right. Well, there you have it, uh, four important trials published and released today from the American Heart Association. I wanna thank Pyle and uh, Deepak for participating. This is Kim Eagle for ACC.org and we're out. <laughs>